Hi, everybody. Uh, Sam Scott here from Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, where I teach AI and machine learning. Uh, this is my second video on the large language models behind ChatGPT. Um, in this one, we're going to lift the lid and take a look inside and try and explain what's going on in a way that's easy to understand, um, even if you don't have a lot of computer science or math background. All right, so this is ChatGPT Journey Through an LLM, Large Language Model. Um, if you haven't yet, um, you should probably take a look at my first uh, video. In that video, I um, talk about the core task of ChatGPT and models like that, um, which is that given a text prompt, their main job is to predict the next natural language token um, that comes next. So uh, next natural language token, meaning ne essentially next word, but it can also mean punctuation and sequences of letters and parts of words and stuff like that. Um, they are powered by large language models, um, which are implemented with deep artificial neural networks. Uh, the architecture uh, behind those networks is called a transformer architecture. And that's what we're going to look at today. And one of the things we're going to highlight um, is how these networks can generalize. Because where we left things in the last video was um, it's not feasible to just memorize all the possible contexts um, in when you're generating a new word. Um, that was an approach that we took and we saw that it worked for small models, uh, but it's not going to work for big models. So they need to be able to generalize. Um, so this is the journey we're going to take. We're going to start at this end here at the input. We're actually going to look at both ends at the same time um, and sort of converge on the middle in the, these are called transformer blocks in the attention mechanism, which is really where the magic happens. Um, so if we want to just take a quick thousand foot view of uh, chat GPT or, or networks like that, uh, architectures like that, the inputs and outputs um, are strings of natural language tokens, strings of words. So you give it a prompt uh, up to 2000 uh, words long in um, in uh, ChatGPT, even longer in um, in later iterations of ChatGPT, um, these it's tokenized and these are converted to vectors or lists of numbers, um, and all the tokens are fed in at the same time. So if you type, you know, how are you doing today? It's going to token. It's going to turn that into a set of words and then feed all of those words at the same time into the network. Um, it's going to encode them as numbers. So that's what's kind of being shown here, these three little boxes, except it's not three numbers for each word. It's more like 50,000 numbers for each word going in. And what comes out at the other end uh, is 50,000 numbers for each word. So each word kind of takes its own path through the network. And what comes out is uh, a set of numbers that, that represents the network's prediction for the next word. So it's predicting me for tell something for me. And then this is the one we're interested in. If I just type tell me something, then it's predicting that the next word should be good. And if I want to keep predicting, then I'll, I'll do it again. But this time I'll give it the input, tell me something good and see what it predicts for the word good and so on. So that was all talked about in the first video. Uh, in between um, is a bunch of artificial neural networks, mostly artificial neural networks that are doing processing and transformations. Let's talk about what an artificial neural network is just very briefly. Um, it's a bunch of simple calculation devices called artificial neurons that are all hooked up together. Uh, and the best way to think of it, I think, is a neural network takes one set of numbers and transforms it, turns it into another set of numbers. Here's a single artificial neuron. Uh, the inputs to that neuron are over here. So this is its input, this list of four numbers. This is its output. So a single neuron is taking a list of numbers of any size and crunching it down to a single number. That's what a single neuron will do. Um, and it does it using uh, what are called connect weighted connections. I'm just calling them weights here. So basically, uh, each of these numbers is going to be input into the system, but it's going to be scaled by this number here. So the first thing that it does when it's computing its output is it adds up all its input. So it multiplies the first input 0.5 times the first the, the weight of that connection, multiplies the second number by the weight of that connection, and so on. That's what's going on down here. It adds them all up and finds that it has a total input of 0.99 in this case. Then it runs that through a kind of a squashing function, an activation function right here. So let's take a look at that activation function. There's a lot of different um, graphs, act activation function shapes. This one is, is hyperbolic tangent. It doesn't really matter. It's one of a number of options that are out there. Um, but the basic idea is that we take the input, which was 0.99, so it's going to be about here, and we figure out what we should output based on this function. So the output should be about 0.75. This particular one is hyperbolic tangent, 10h. 
Um, you can find that on a scientific calculator. It's usually two button presses, one for hyperbolic, one for tangent. Um, this is the shape of the function. So whatever the input, it squashes it down between about one and negative one. And that's what most of these functions do something like that. And so the output here is going to be 0.76. So back to our original picture here, the input comes in, it gets scaled or weighted and then added up. And then it goes through a function to produce the output. Um, this is a very simple calculation device. Um, it's limited to what are called linear combinations of numbers. So it can't it can only add them up. It can't multiply two numbers together. It can't take the square root of a number or anything like that. Um, but you can overcome those limitations if you hook a bunch of them up together into a network. And then you can approximate any kind of operation um, that you need to approximate. So here's an artificial neural network. The inputs are over here and the outputs are over here. So everything in here, except for that first layer of inputs, everything's an, uh, an artificial neuron. These are the output neurons over here. And the weights are this big forest of, of lines connecting the neurons over here. Probably looks a little overwhelming, but um, if you want to just, if you just take a, if we zero in on one neuron here. So I'm highlighting here the inputs to this one neuron in the first layer. So notice that there are, there are layers to this network. Most neural networks, um, and including large language models, um, are layered uh, neural networks. So this first layer, uh, this first layer neuron gets input from all of the inputs before it. And then it only has one output, but it sends that output number to everything in the next layer. So that's what was causing these patterns here. Every neuron is, is attached, is connected to every other neuron. And they're all operating in the same way. They're adding up all of their inputs, um, weighted by the strengths of the, of the connection weights. And then they're putting them through a function and then sending that output to all of the neurons in the next layer. Um, and it turns out that this uh, can be quite a, um, a powerful um, calculation device. Um, the weights are often referred to as parameters uh, these days. So uh, when you hear it said that uh, Chad GPT has 175 billion parameters, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the weights between individual neurons. Now, neural networks are known to learn. How do you train or teach a neural network? Well, you do it by adjusting its parameters, adjusting the weights. So if you change the numbers that are connecting these neurons here, you're going to change the output. So let's say uh, I have an input here to my artificial neuron. These are my inputs. Um, the input gets added up, multiplied by the weights. Then we go through tan H, and then we get the output, which is great. But let's say I wanted zero. So typically when you're training a network, all of the initial weights, all the parameters are set kind of randomly. Um, so when you present an example to the network, a set of numbers to the network, it's just going to kind of, you know, the, the output you're going to get is, is not going to be what you want. It's going to be some random number. Um, so I wanted, I got 0.76, but I wanted it to be zero. So now my job is to adjust the weights of the network to get this closer to what I wanted. So yeah, I wanted zero. So I just changed the weights a little bit. So change these guys here. So 0.3 will become 0.25, negative 0.2 will become negative 0.3, and so on and so on. And when I, if I were to run this example again, the input would be different. So the input's gone from 0.99 to 0.635. I've just moved these in the direction that will lower the overall input. Uh, tan of 0.635 turns out to be 0.56. So it used to be 0.76, now it's 0.56. So it's still not what I want, but it's closer. Uh, and we just do this over and over and over again with lots of different examples. All those examples are going to push these weights in different directions individually, and eventually we hope to come to a happy medium where all of my examples are correct. So um, an artificial neural network, the only thing left to talk about is how you train that. Well, you have your inputs and your outputs. You Generally, you know what out, you want your output to be. So this network transforms a set of five numbers into a set of six and then seven and then so on. And we end with a new set of transformed five numbers over here. We typically know what we wanted over here. So we can adjust these weights here first to get these numbers closer to what we want. So we fix the output layer weights. Fixing the, um, the rest of the weights is a little bit more tricky um, and actually stalled neural network development for a while in the 60s, uh, the 50s and 60s. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, it was kind of discovered that there's this process called backpropagation where we basically go back one at a time through the layers, fixing the weights. Um, and at each step, we we fix them based on how much error um, the neuron that they're feeding into was responsible for in the previous layer. Anyways, details of that don't really matter. The point is it's a solvable problem um, and backpropagation will often um, allow us to find a pretty good solution to whatever problem it is we're, we're throwing at the network. 
Um, here's a real neuron, you know, just in case you're curious, why do we call these neurons? Neurons are cells in the nervous system. This is what they look like. They are electrically active. So they have these chemical electrical connections um, that they get input from. Um, all that charge builds up in the cell body there in the middle. And then when, when the charge gets too big, it fires um, a, a sort of a pulse, an electrical pulse down its output, which connects to multiple neurons downstream. So this is kind of the inspiration um, the thought that these neurons are, are simple computational elements in, in the, the nervous system of an animal or a human. Um, the weights part, well, we kind of know that some, uh, some connections are stronger than others. Some connections are kind of negative. They have the opposite effect of positive connections. And in a real neural network like this, there's some evidence that learning happens uh, by reconfiguring those connections, maybe maybe adding or removing correct connections, making them stronger or weaker. There's no real evidence of backpropagation per se, um, but we do think that's how that that's at least how learning in some cases happens in the brain. So it's it's a loose metaphor. Um, we still call them artificial neurons, but they're not really very close to real neurons. It's a it's they they only kind of look like real neurons from a very, very far distance away. All right, so let's go back to our thousand foot view. Um, we've got tokens being converted into vectors, uh, and then they go through a bunch of artificial neural networks and vectors come out the other end that represent the predictions. And uh, yeah, it, it amounts to about a hundred million inputs and outputs. Um, so you, if you have uh, the list of numbers coming in here is 50,000 for each token, chat GPT can, uh, or GPT-3 can take 2000 tokens of input. So if you multiply that out, it's it's huge numbers. All right, so now we're ready to start the journey, having done that little uh, aside. Um, so we're gonna talk about kind of both ends of the network, um, the tokenization uh, and conversion of, of words into numbers, and then the conversion back at the other end from numbers back into words. So this is what tokenization looks like. Um, you can, there's, this is, there's a website that you can go to, uh, the address is there, where you can see how OpenAI, how, how ChatGPT tokenizes its input. So it's color coded it here. So you can see the word am and the word student are each their own tokens. Um, I deliberately mixed in some French here to show you that it doesn't do as good of a job of tokenizing French as it does English um, because it's exposed to a lot more English. So these the the correct the tokenization is kind of formed by the statistical properties of its input. Um, it's it to to the system, it's just a, a sequence of characters that appears a lot. Um, so that's why it has better support for English than it does for other languages, but it's also why it's able to support any language. So it can tokenize anything. It's just that the tokens that it comes up with for, I don't know, Swahili uh, might not be as good or Python or Java might not be as good as the tokens that it comes up with for English, um, but it can often still work really, really well with those languages. So that's the first thing it does is it splits the text into little chunks. Uh, a token is a word or a part of a word or some punctuation, and and it has a vocabulary. The, vo the vocabulary is the set of tokens that it knows about. So when it tokenizes, it does it according to its vocabulary. Um, then what it does is it has to turn those tokens into numbers. So let's take a token here, tell. Um, the first cut at turning it into numbers is very simplistic. It creates this thing called a one-hot encoding. So this is a list of numbers, and it's got one entry for every token in the vocabulary of the system. So every word that it knows about has a number associated with it. I've just put some random words underneath it here to illustrate that. Um, so it creates a vector of almost all zeros with just a single one in it. It just puts the one um, at, the at the correct position for encoding this word. So you can see in this example here, the tell, the token is tell. So it's all zeros except for the number that stands for the word tell, and that's set to a one. Um, this is its vocabulary here mapped along the bottom of it. And it's going to be, these vectors are going to be about 50,000 long or some tens of thousands of words long. Okay, so now we've got, we've gone from text to numbers, which is good because neural networks need numbers, but these are not very high quality numbers. So back to the thousand foot view here. Um, we are putting in um, a one hot encoding of each of these tokens. So each of these has 50,000 numbers, mostly zeros with a single one. And then, and then we do a bunch of transformations. And what we want is at the other end, we want one hot encodings of the predictions. But because it's kind of a messy process, um, we, we don't get 
a nice clean one hot encoding. We get we don't just get zeros and ones. We get um, all kinds of different numbers out the other end. But the higher the number, the more likely it is that that's really the next word. Um, so uh, so what we do is we interpret the numbers that come out the other end not as a one hot encoding, but as a probability distribution. And we scale them down so that they're between zero and one. And then we see, okay, well, for this token here, tell me was the highest, the, the, in, in the encoding that came out, the, the number that, that stands for the word me was the highest number. So that's our best prediction. Uh, but him and my were also, would also be good choices here to predict the next word. Okay. Uh, and in between is a bunch of, um, uh, neural networks. So again, so what we've done here is we've done the uh, the front the front end and the back end of this thing. We're gonna we're gonna kind of enclose in on the middle on what's going on in there. But first, let's just just a quick note on training to link it back to what I said about neural networks earlier. Um, so what we do is we have the we might have the actual output. So let's say this is for the word something, and we wanted the correct the correct output according to the text that we were training on is uh, we, we saw the sequence tell me something good. So we fed it tell me something, and we're hoping to see a one hot encoding come out the other end for good. But we don't get that, we get this. So we get something like a probability distribution. We wanted this. So we subtract one of these from the other to get this. So uh, all of these should have been zero, but it, they were 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.05. Him and me were correct, but the other ones were incorrect. And this one was incorrect, but in the other direction. It should have been a 1, but it was too low. It was 0 0.8. That's why it's negative 0.2 there. Each of these um, numbers came out of a neuron. So now we have, for, the, for each of those neurons, we have the desired output, 0 or 1, and the actual output. And then we can modify the weights um, that went into that neuron to move it closer to what we want. Um, so uh, based on the errors. So this error signal is used to tune the weights of the artificial neurons. So for good, it output a 0.8, so we would in probably increase most of its weights to try and get it to output a 1 next time. For I, it output 0.2, but we wanted 0, so we would try and change the weights to decrease the amount of uh, output next time. All right, so now we've uh, we've done those two ends. We've done the tokenization and conversion to one-hot encodings, and we've got at the other end, we don't quite get a one hot encoding. We get a bunch of kind of messy numbers. Um, this The word here, softmax, is just the name for a process of converting any set of numbers into a probability distribution. So it kind of scales them down so they're between zero and one. All right, uh, now we're gonna do embeddings. So one hot encodings are great. Uh, they, well, they're, they're fine, they're, they're numbers now, so we can do something with them, but they're not gonna be very useful for generalizing. So the first real step of computation here is to take those one hot encodings and turn them into smaller but more information rich vectors. So if we start with the one hot encoding here for the word tell, we want to convert it to an embedding. Um, and the embedding will be a smaller vector. So in, in GPT, it's length 12,000 instead of 50,000. So still pretty big. Um, but instead of just uh, all zeros with a single one, it's got a whole bunch of numeric information in it. Interpreting that information is pretty tricky, um, but and and these these embeddings are computed by an artificial neural network um, that is trained as part of the whole training process to come up with better and better embeddings. So there's your artificial neural network. It's just a single layer. Um, the one hot encoding is the input, and the single layer of neurons computes the embedding, twelve thousand um, numbers for the output. Um, what is in an embedding? So we've known about embeddings for a long time. They've, this 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 idea has been out there for a good 20 years in the neural network natural language processing community. There's lots of ways to learn them, but generally speaking, what they end up encoding is distribution patterns for words. So words that appear in similar contexts tend to have similar embeddings, uh, and that's useful for generalization. So for example, the embeddings for cat and dog are going to be more similar than the embedding for the word cat and the word tickle, because those two words appear in very different contexts, whereas cat and dog, both being nouns, both being animals, tend to appear in very similar contexts. If you were to graph this, you wouldn't be able to visualize it because you would have to graph it in 12,000 dimensions. But if you imagine it just in two dimensions, just imagine that the vectors only had two numbers. Um, so cat and dog is each a pair of numbers. You could imagine graphing it where one number's on the on the horizontal and one's on the vertical, what you might see is that dog and cat are quite close to one another in that space, whereas the word tickle is far away and over here. Um, so now imagine that in 12,000 dimensions, 
which you can't do because no human being can imagine 12,000 dimensions, but the math is no different. Um, you can you can show the idea of two things being close in a two or three dimensional space generalizes up to two things being close in a, in a 12,000 dimensional space. Um, now they're very hard to interpret these embeddings and sometimes they resist interpretation, but we have been able to show consistent relationships between embeddings. Um, so he, these are just some examples from um, that, that are well known in the literature. Uh, I didn't make these pictures. Um, you know, so the idea here is that the words king and queen are basically the same word, but they differ in uh, in gender, in masculine versus feminine. And same thing with uncle and aunt, basically the same word, different in gender and so on. And if you literally just take those the two embeddings, so if you take the embedding for king, the 12,000 numbers, and you subtract from that the 12,000 numbers that represent queen, you get about the same result as if you subtract uncle from aunt or man from woman. So they're about kind of the same distance away from each other and in the same direction. Um, so there's a consistent relationship between these words. And it's represented kind of holistically across all 12,000 numbers, but it is somewhat consistent. Similarly, uh, with plurality, that's another one, you can show that the difference between king and kings is similar to the difference between queen and queens. So this is this representation is what allows our transformer to generalize. And if you remember, that's what we really needed here. To be able to do these massive contexts with billions and billions of tokens, we needed to be able to not just have to memorize each possible context, but recognize when two contexts are similar. And that's what this lets us do, these this set of numbers. Uh, now, these embeddings are going to get transformed, um, hence the name transformer, I guess. Um, so we've got one hot encodings coming in. Uh, they get translated in this first part of the network to embeddings. Then a bunch of transformations happen, and we end up with a new set of transformed embeddings at the other end. And once we've got that new set of transformed embeddings, we can run the same network that went from the one hot encoding down here to the embeddings. We run it, essentially we run it in reverse. It's the inverse operation, mathematically speaking. But we take that same network and we run it backwards uh, to try and turn these transformed embeddings back into one hot encodings. But it doesn't work very well. It's a mess, like it's very unlikely that the embeddings at this end are going to exactly correspond to the embedding to a single word, especially since we're being trained on lots of different contexts. Um, so there's lots of different possibilities for the next word after tell me something. There's no one right answer, really. Um, so what we end up with is this uh, sort of a messy vector that we can interpret instead of as a one hot encoding as a probability distribution. It's pretty cool. Um, so again, this process, we have the one hot encoding we put it through a neural network to turn it into an embedding. Then we do a bunch of transformations on it, and we end up with a transformed embedding. And then we run that through the same neural network, but backwards. Notice I turned it around in this picture. Let's see that clever use of graphics on my part. Uh, and it becomes a probability distribution. So we're the aim of this network is to turn it into a one hot encoding, the name of this network here, but it, it doesn't work out because this embedding doesn't match any particular one hot encoding, but it may be as similar to a bunch of them. So we end up with a probability distribution showing the ones that it's most similar to. All right, so now we've got, uh, we've, we've extended at both ends here. We've talked about the process of changing the one hot encodings to embeddings and vice versa. Now we need to look at really this is where uh, this is where all the innovations in the transformer architecture are, and where the real magic happens um, is in positional encoding and then the transformer blocks. So positional encoding, uh, the position of a word is important, right? Uh, there's a lot of differences between the word "tell" in the these two sentences. Please tell the poker players it's a verb. Every poker player has a "tell." It's a noun. If you don't play poker, a "tell" is um, like if you have good cards. Um, maybe your eyebrow will twitch or something like that, and other poker players will be able to read that and know that you have good cards. Um, that's that's called a tell, uh, something that you do that gives away what you've got. Um, so, anyways, uh, this you know, there's a lot of differences between those two words, but one important piece of information is the position that those words occur in. So, uh, and you might say, well, we've already got the position because we're presenting the words in that order uh, down at the bottom of the network. We're presenting them in the order that they came. And that's true, but we're about to head into a place in, in, called the intention mechanism, the attention mechanism, where those words are going to start talking to each other. 
uh, using their embeddings. And there's nothing in the embedding that tells us what position that word was in. So that's what we have to do is we have to add some information to the embeddings so that so that there's information in there that could be retrieved um, that tells us not only what that word was, but where it was in the input. Um, so we create what's called a positional encoding. So again, here's our initial embedding for the word tell. Then uh, we, it's in the first case, it's in position two. So we create a set of numbers that represents a positional encoding for that position. And we simply add it to uh, the embedding for tell to get the positional embedding for that word. At, so tell looks like this, but tell at position two looks like this. And you can see I've just added 1.2 plus 0.84 is 2.04. You can check my math, but each pair of numbers adds up. Um, now this one over here is in position six in the second example. So what's that gonna look like? Well, the positional encoding for six is gonna be a different set of numbers. So the positional embedding for tell in the sixth position looks a little bit different than the embedding for tell in the second position. The numbers are a little bit different. Um, and basically, I don't want to get too much into the details. They use uh, some complex use of sine and cosine functions. But basically, what they do is they just have a way of generating a unique set of numbers, so a unique fingerprint for each position, each of the 2,000 positions, and then they just add in that position into the embedding. Uh, why does this work? I don't know. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that anybody else does either. Um, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but um, but a lot of neural network development is like this, um, which is not at all to say that there's that the people working on this stuff are not super smart and creative and clever, um, and the the transformer architecture is amazing. Um, but you know, often there's no first principles involved in any of this. People are trying different things, throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Somebody had a hunch that we could encode position in this way and spread it across the whole vector and that the neural networks downstream would be able to pull that information out. And it just has so happens that it worked out. It might not have, but it did. Um, why did it work out? I don't think anybody's 100% clear on exactly why it worked out, other than that neural networks have a, a big capacity um, to learn um, all kinds of information that's embedded in those in, in, in those encodings. Um, if somebody has a better answer than that, I'm 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 open to it. So uh, if there is a better sort of reason from first principles why this should have worked better than some other way of encoding position, please put it in the in the comments. All right. So now we've gotten past the positional encoding over here, and so our positionally encoded embeddings go into what's called a transformer block, sometimes called a decoder block. There's two components in there, and the real magic one is the attention component. So this is where the words the word representations talk to each other and get changed based on the context that they are in. So here's how it works. I'm just going to gloss over it real fast um, uh, in, in general terms. Again, we have a positional embedding coming in. So the word tell, it, it got turned into an embedding, and then it got it, positional information was added, so it became a positional embedding. And now we have a neural network that decomposes this, uh, that changes this embedding into three components. It creates three things called a query, a key, and a value. And this is all done through neural networks, which are trained um, during training. The, the, the network weights are changed and so on. So three different networks transform um, the length 12,000 vector into three different length 128 vectors called the query, the key, and the value. So the idea here is that the value represents some aspect of the meaning of the word. Um, the query represents a request from that word to find other words that might be relevant to it um, based on some specific criterion. Um, and then the key is the answer. So if another word asks, uh, says, here's my query, um, the, all the other words uh, will try and match their keys to the query to see if they're a good fit or not. And if they are a good fit, then they will, they will have a big influence on the, on the interpretation of that word. So that's that's what it all means. It's um it's a pretty crazy uh, and interesting and cool system. Uh, it's also done ninety six times. So each word, like the word tell, this doesn't happen once, being split into query, key, and value. It happens ninety six times with ninety six different neural networks that are all trained differently. They come from different starting points. So the idea there is that they can end up attending to different things that are important in the context. Maybe one of them looks at verb tense, another one looks at plurality, and maybe another one looks at, um, 
you know, uh, contexts that have to do with human activities. And another one is, is interested in contexts that have to do with physical processes in the world or something like that. Who knows? I haven't seen any interpretations of this. I think it's notoriously difficult to interpret what each of these attention heads, as they're called, is doing. Um, but, uh, but they all do the same thing. They split into query key and value, but they do it slightly differently. 96 of them. And the relevant words being combined, well, what that looks like is this. So let's say we have every poker player has a tell, period. Those are our input tokens. Um, and we're going to focus on the word tell. That's why it's underlined. So tell compares its query to, to the key of every token that comes before it. So every poker player has a, but not the key of the period uh, or any other words that might come on the right. So each one only looks at its preceding context. And the values of good matches are combined. So it looks like this. Tell has a query and a key and a value. So does poker and so does every. I'm just showing it for two different words here, the words every and poker. Uh, so tell sends out its query and tries to match it against the key values of the previous words. And let's say that in this attention head, that there are there's a good match between the query for tell and the key for poker. Then basically the value for poker is going to get added in to the value for tell, just like we added in the positional encoding. Um, but it's going to get multiplied before it gets added. And if it's a good match, it'll get multiplied by a big number, like maybe 0.6. So all the numbers in, in the value for poker will get multiplied by 0.6, then they'll get added into the to tell. And let's say that this the query for tell does not match the, que the key for every very well. So the value for every will still get added in, but might have a very small influence. So it might get multiplied by 0 0.01. So it hardly has any effect on the word tell. So at the end of this process, the value for tell, that, those 128 numbers, will now represent the original values for tell plus some influence, some stuff added in from the previous context. The idea being that the more relevant words, hopefully, will have had a bigger influence on the word tell than the less relevant words. And again, this is done 96 times. And then the final values. So tell now has 96 different values, each of length 128. They are concatenated, which means strung together to create a new embedding vector. So we have 96 value vectors, 96 times 128 is 12,288, which is the actual length of the vector. I've been fudging it a bit by saying 12,000. So we get a new embedding vector coming out the other end. So tell now has a new contextualized embedding. Um, now that might not be a very good embedding though. Um, so we put it through a feed forward network um, inside the transformer block to tweak it a little bit more, to give the network a chance to um, to make it more like uh, the embedding for an actual word that we know about. Um, so the feed forward layer is just an, it's feed forward just means another layered neural network. Feed forward meaning the 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 signal starts down here and moves forward layer by layer. Um, it transforms the embedding again, but it doesn't change its length. So the transformed embedding goes in the bottom here, twelve thousand numbers. It goes through a layer, a larger layer, and then comes back down to another layer of the same size, twelve thousand to create an even more transformed embedding. Um, why? Again, it, because it works um, is the answer. I mean, I think the hunch is that after that query and value process, you might not end up with something that really looks very much like a real embedding. So this is a chance to, to tweak it, to bring it closer to um, an embedding for a word that's actually known about in the system. All right, so that's the entire transformer block. And then we do that whole, so what, what goes in there are the positional embeddings. What comes out of that transformer block are a new set of embeddings, which have had some context included in them. And then we do that exact same process again, and then again. Um, why? I think it happens three times in GPT-3, but it can happen multiple times. Why three? Again, because it seemed to work okay. There's, there's no better answer, I don't think, forthcoming than that. Um, they might've tried five and found that um, that it took 10 months to train instead of six months to train, and the the result wasn't much better than, than the smaller model. They might have tried one and found that it trained a lot faster, but it wasn't as good at making predictions as when they had three. So a lot of this stuff is, again, there's an art to it. You know, you just try a bunch of stuff. So that's it. That's the whole architecture. Um, I, I fully expect that even though I, I don't think I, I made it, I don't think I made it super complicated, but you still might have to go back and look at it again if you really want to, you know, convince yourself that you have a, a gut view of how the whole thing works. And you might want to um, uh, cross-reference what I'm saying here with other sources as well. It's up to you. But uh, 
Um, yeah, I'm not saying it's not complicated, but I think it's it's the way that I presented it, I hope is accessible. Um, so just to recap again, just the whole process, um, the inputs come in, they are, they're encoded as these one hot encodings, then they get changed to embeddings with a neural network. Positional encodings are added. Um, these, that's not a neural network, that's a fixed process. Then a bunch of attention steps happen where the words talk to each other and try to transform each other based on, based on their context, based on what's important in the context. And then we do this reverse embedding. So we end up with a new set of embeddings there. We reverse them to try and get back the one hot encodings, but we get back probability distributions in most cases, not nice, clean one hot encodings. And then we choose from the, the highest values in the probability distribution. Um, we choose the, the words from there. All right. So I call this section what we know and don't know. Um, here's where I might get a little bit more controversial, I think, about what, what all this means. Uh, we all know how well chat GPT and those other systems do. And now hopefully you have some sense of how they're doing what they do. And it, you, it, depending on what you thought coming in, it might not be what you thought. You might have expected to see you know, a reasoning module or a thinking module or a place where it converts the language into thoughts and then can and then processes those thoughts and then converts them back into language, which is kind of what we think we do. Um, but but you wouldn't have found that in there. It's not obvious that it's in there. So we know that Chappie GPT is predicting the next token based on a generalized context. So not a specific context, but it a, it, it does it based on contexts that it's that are similar to, to, to the one that it's looking at right now. We know that it processes thousands of words in parallel, um, unlike what the human mind does. Like, um, it's, we're, I think we're, we can be pretty sure that when you read a news article, you don't collect all the input and then run that entire news article all at the same time through your brain, that you process it sequentially. Um, so quite differently from the way ChatGPT does it. Um, we know that tokens are represented as vectors of numbers, which may well be what's going on in your brain. Um, each vector gets transformed into a prediction. Um, we also know that this, this process results in hallucin hallucinations. And as I tried to point out in the last um, video, that shouldn't be surprising. What, to me, what's most surprising is how often it does not hallucinate, because it's the exact same process. It's just looking at the previous words and, and taking a guess at what it thinks the next word should be. Uh, just doing nothing more than that. Um, and uh, so it's, it shouldn't be surprising that it occasionally comes up with a word that's incorrect and leads it down a path where it gives you an incorrect solution or it makes a common sense reasoning error or something like that. And uh, this is a well-known issue with these with these systems um, and nobody has a solution for it. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, before, before I was making this video, OpenAI said that they were gonna try and solve it through training. I wanna talk about that in a different video, but uh, I, I'm, I'm skeptical. And I think most people are skeptical of how this can be solved. Um, uh, so, so that's one issue. And then the second thing that comes up is, is ChatGPT thinking or reasoning? Because even the designers that made it will sometimes say that they that they think it is, that maybe it's an emergent, a spooky emergent property of this system, even though they didn't program it to think or to reason, um, but its ability to take into account context maybe is, is approximating or, or producing reasoning behavior. I think that the jury's still very out on this, but I am inclined to a negative view of that, of, of whether it's thinking or reasoning. Um, I think that if you think that something like human reasoning or or um, biological biologically uh, implemented reasoning is going on inside these networks, I think that the onus is on you to to prove that statement. Um, what I see is a system that's really really good at um, figuring out what's what words are relevant in a particular context, working only with language and nothing else, um, produce a, a very plausible string of output text that when we look at it, looks like it's reasoning. Um, but just because we think it's reason, just because it activates our language modules uh, and, and which are hyperactive in their search for meaning, just because we can put meaning on the words being produced doesn't mean that the system meant anything or is saying anything or is necessarily thinking or reasoning. And I, I, I guess I'll leave it with this question. What would William of Occam say? Um, if you've ever done any philosophy of science, you might've encountered Occam's razor. So the idea here is that um, is that if you have two competing hypotheses, uh, two explanations for the same phenomenon, you should choose the explanation. If you don't have any other evidence and you've just got these two equally good explanations, you should choose the explanation that requires the fewest assumptions. 
And so I think that there's an alternative explanation. When you look at chat GPT, you say, okay, it seems to be thinking and it's producing intelligent behavior. It's, so it must be thinking and reasoning. Um, I think another, another uh, take on that is that, it, no, it's not thinking or reasoning. It really is just predicting the next word, which is what it was designed to do. It's just that there's an awful lot more information encoded in the distributional patterns of this massive amount of human language that it's trained on. There's a lot more information in there than we thought. And, and it's, it's surprising how that can be, that that can be leveraged in the way that it is because nobody would have expected that. But since we're sure that that's what it's doing, it's predicting the next word, based on context, then that must mean that there's a lot more information in that context than we thought was there. Uh, and, and there's a lot more chance to leverage it. And I think that 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 explanation, I think, requires fewer assumptions than saying that even though we only built it to predict the next word, it's somehow found a way within the, the system that we built to reason or to think. So again, I'm not saying it's not reasoning or thinking, um, but I think that that the, the onus is on the people who think that to, to prove that it's the case or to, to demonstrate, give us good reasons to think that that is what's really happening and that it's not just that it's it's leveraging massive amounts of context and then producing strings of text that we put meanings on um, that uh, that make it seem like it's reasoning. And I think that my view, the view that I'm, I'm inclined towards, um, has a perfectly good explanation for hallucinations. Whereas if your view is that it's that it's thinking and reasoning, it becomes harder to explain those hallucinations. But I'll let you guys make up your own mind. Okay, so up next, um, in the next set of videos, uh, I'm going to do a few things. I'm not sure what order I'm going to do them in, but I want to talk about training because there's actually a lot uh, that goes into training these these um, the systems to be chat systems. Um, so I want to talk about the various steps of training they go through and how human beings are involved in a lot of that training. Um, I want to talk about prompt engineering. Uh, and then I, I, I think I want to say something I have been, as we've been going, about the social and ethical and cognitive implications of all this as well. So I think that that's probably where I'm going next. And if you're interested in any of those topics, um, you can leave a comment. Uh, if there's something that you would like to see a video on or, or a further explanation of, um, that uh, that you would like me to make a video about or take a crack at, go for it. And if you think there's something wrong with anything that I said, um, feel free to put it in the uh, put it in the chat, and uh, we can have a discussion about it.